Well, you're a tough act to follow, but I'm glad you gave me that segue, because these are not big things that I brought. I did um, bring three case studies that, for me, uh, were all experiments in trying to confront all of the themes of sustainability, but really on my own terms. And I'll talk a little bit about what on my own terms means, but for me, I really think uh, innovation and um, taking a fresh look at materials, but also logistics involved in those materials, and some of the popular culture associations, and the look and feel of spaces and objects is really what's critical to changing the game a little bit. So these three case studies really break down into these, these three themes. <coughs> and um, the first one was a very kind of high pressure thing for me because I was asked a couple of years ago to design the traveling exhibition for the Index Awards. And their motto is design to improve life. They're not really about sustainability. But they have these uh, different categories of design they give awards to and they ship around all over the world 80 objects that represent the finalists and winners in these different categories. And so they came to me and they said, look, uh, whatever you do has to be in a sustainable material. We think it probably should be wood because this is a, a Danish organization and they think of wood as a kind of good symbol for them. And uh, they told me where these things would go. They want to use it for two cycles, for the 2012 awards and the 2014 awards, and maybe even after that. And then they told me all of the stories about vandalism, taking these things up and putting them down on very short time periods, how undersupported and underfunded they were, how difficult it was to get them power. Um, and the more we, we looked at these things, um, the more the logistics of them was actually more interesting than the objects themselves. And so we started talking about the budget, which I don't think they'd want me to tell you, so let's just call it X. So the budget for the construction of about a dozen of these pavilions was 1X. They then told me that the shipping and assembly of these was six times the budget of the objects. And that that was because they assumed we were going to use 12 shipping containers to move all of these displays around, because that's what they'd done the last two times they did them. So I made a proposal to them, and I said, if I can save you half the shipping containers, can I take half of your budget to make the objects? And that was our deal. In the end, we did everything in one shipping container, where the last one was 12 and 13. And I mean, we saved them hundreds of thousands of euros in doing that. So these pavilions are made uh, to be very logistically streamlined. Each one of them breaks down and could put it in the back of your station wagon. Um, the way we did that is we made them lightweight. Um, they're made with carbon fiber reinforced plastic and aluminum uh, and plastic panels, the Lucabon panels. But that means that two people can put these things up and down by themselves. You can do two pavilions a day, pretty much. And that includes all the wiring and um, display. Um, there are really no mechanical connections in the whole thing. It's all done with Velcro. And the vitrines actually help hold up the structure. Um, the way that they break down is they flat pack. So even the vitrines unfold and can be refolded again. Um, and as I said, we cut them down. They go to about a city a month uh, for two years. So, and the cities are in Asia, North America, and, and Europe. Um, they're incredibly strong. So, we really haven't done a detailed um, energy analysis of this. But one of the things we noticed is the vandals the first day in Copenhagen, three of them were hospitalized because one of them rode a motorcycle into one to try to knock it into uh, the canal. <laughs> People were climbing on them and fell into them. They're actually very lethal objects if you try to vandalize them. So a lot of the budget that was used, um, by the end of two years, they were typically replacing the entire system because they were getting incrementally vandalized. Um, but so, so far, so good. 
we're only hurting the citizens, not the objects. Um, another use of this kind of carbon, um, which I think uh, is really one of the most interesting sustainable materials. It's a terrible material to produce. It's very energy intensive. Um, it's as expensive as diamonds in some cases, but you use so little of it that in the case of index, it became the most, most affordable solution. Um, for me, tensile structures, and I apologize in advance to be saying this in this place with this man in the front row, <laughs> but catenoidal curves make me sad because they hang. And so we have now are developing a chair, of which this is a prototype, made of very thin ply carbon tapes which are molded onto a, a tool and vacuum cooked. And instead of having the shape of a, te of a textile, it has this inflection and curvature, which for me has much more energy and much more kind of visual appeal, as well as being more ergonomically comfortable than a hanging chair. And this chair will get shipped in a FedEx pack. So, and it'll also be stored like you store things in a filing cabinet. So instead of all the inventory and shipping and logistics of a typical chair that weighs hundreds of pounds, this weighs a few ounces and we've had over 500 uh, pounds in it. Um, another theme for me is trying to have longevity by adding value and building things to last. And I taught for some time in Switzerland where buildings are so expensive you have to make them last. And one of the things that I thought was interesting would be to put plastics and the technologies of modern construction against this idea of building something to last. And it really came from a kind of sentimental desire, which is when my kids were little, they were running through these plastic rotomolded toys like crazy. Like every six weeks we were buying them some new rotomolded object. And my wife, who grew up in Italy, loves shiny plastic bright colored things and we were saving them. And we were developing a kind of whole back building full of these sentimental toys. And I also was watching my colleagues who were doing some very interesting things with technology and bricks. And I thought, well, I need to have some attitude about bricks and I want to have an attitude about recycling plastic. And so maybe what I'll do is take these toys that my kids had had, uh, scan them digitally and use them as bricks and try to collect as many of these used toys as possible and, and build walls out of these hollow plastic bricks. Um, in the end, uh, <laughs> you can see some of the, every country actually has their own thing. The Germans have the ducks, the Italians have the eggplants. Um, so, and what I found is that you know, plastics, it's always winning. When you put plastics against something, it's always winning. It's so cheap, it's so strong, it's so easily formed, it's indestructible. So to tell people they can't use plastic cups is very tough. Um, I was with the head of the Obama Sustainability Administration, and she said that in California, you're better off using a plastic cup and throwing it away than you are using a ceramic cup and washing it with water in terms of total energy use because the water is more expensive than the plastic. So this is a material that's amazing, but we just throw it away. So this project is really about why you would save it. So we took these digital animals and toys and configured them on the computer and cut them with this robot in Los Angeles. This is a company called Machinus. And like bricks, they all interlock with each other and get welded into a very solid structural element. This is furniture we did for the Venice Biennale. I actually won a golden lion for this, if you can believe it. So banal. Um, we've scaled them up to fountains, you know, where we're using now hundreds of objects. We've done several of these. Um, and we've even built a kind of freestanding dome in these bricks. Uh, which gets more challenging. Uh, but anyway, upcycling, using materials and elevating them to some level of dignity, I think is another strategy for approaching these issues and actually engaging the materials that everyone sees as the enemy. I mean, for me, carbon fiber, plastic toys, these are the things everybody hates, like Waldorf schools won't allow them in the building. But for me, they're actually maybe the source of a lot of um, innovative thinking. Okay, the last case study I brought is um, 
for me a kind of um, a response to clients who ask to have a sustainable building. Uh, they asked to have all recycled jeans for insulation. They wanted all bamboo floors. They came with a whole laundry list of materials. And what I said to them is, there's a spatial idea you're asking me to do, which is they're art collectors and they wanted a lot of white, uh, unobstructed surface. Um, but they also didn't want to live in a minimalist house. They're very clear, they didn't want a loft, they didn't want to live in an art gallery, they wanted a cozy house. So for me, this was a challenge to try to do a kind of minimalism, uh, which also engaged their desire to have uh, a, a kind of Southern California house that they wouldn't be ashamed of because of its size and because of the materials that were used. Um, so there were a few things that came out of this. The first is reducing the number of components is always a sign of innovation. I th I'm very frustrated with, um, let's say my students and even some colleagues who will say, I found a way with a computer to make what would have been built in a thousand parts in 10,000 parts. And those thousand parts would have been standard, my 10,000 parts are all unique. And the computer is letting me do this complexity. And I always wonder, what is this complexity for? For me, if you go to an industrialist and say, I found a way to make your chair uh, or your coffee pot out of 10 times as many parts, it's gonna be a really short meeting. So with um, products, I was asked by Alessi to be a, in a group of 20 architects that redid the coffee and tea services and using aerospace titanium, we built coffee, tea, and milk containers in a tray in a total of 10 surfaces. And one of the things in the brief was Alberto said, architects don't use handles, make sure it has handles. Um, I decided to make it all handles. So there's a silicon break, so you can grab this everywhere, and it looks ergonomic. I mean, you see it on a table, you want to grab it, and a lot of those forms fit a lot of different hands. Um, so it was really about taking an object which had mechanical parts and details and turning those mechanical parts and details into surfaces. We really, at a mass level, commercialized that with these cups. Same idea, it's all handles, like a Turkish coffee cup. Um, with a chair for Vitra, I wanted to do the chair in two surfaces, a hard surface for the legs and a soft surface for the top. The, the soft surface is much more complex. It's a 3D knitted textile. Um, but really it was about getting an ergonomics and construction logic to get simpler and simpler and simpler, to just reduce components and make surfaces more intelligent and more comfortable and ergonomic. So these objects are what led to the design of the, of the house. The first idea was to integrate all of the equipment into the walls of the house. So you can see here that the hearth, the home office, the breakfast nook, it's all folded into this uh, two, two party wall townhouse. The ceiling uh, also has all of the light in cold cathode tubes and is all integrated into the ceiling surface. The, the house has a feel which is very open. It's a one room living space. It's very compact by the standards of this family. Um, the whole area of the house, about 200 square meters. So that space is modulated by changes in the floor but also by these folding and curving walls. And you can see things like the, the hearth, all the kitchen equipment, the beds, the, the furniture is all absorbed into the walls and floors. Um, the builder of this commented that the framing for the curved walls, which was all laser cut plywood, cut on a 25 year old laser cutter, had less waste than the straight walls, which were all cut from stock lumber and trimmed and discarded and we had to pull a plasterer out of retirement to do all the plaster surfaces. So it was this nice mix of expertise with the computer and expertise with craft. We worked with DuPont to come up with a use of Corian that eliminated a lot of the details. So no handles on the cupboards or anything. Um, in the bathrooms, there's kind of this voluptuous functionalism where the, the cabinets and mirrors and everything are all folded and integrated into one single surface. 
and thanks very much.